something that crops up during the discussion and the debate that we have in the meeting, uh, please make sure you kind of notify us accordingly so the declaration can be recorded uh, accordingly. Moving on to the third item, which is the minutes of the previous meeting. Can I move that those are a correct record uh, of uh, our activities at the, the last meeting, if that's agreed? I'm not seeing any dissent, so I shall take that as read. And then move into our first substantive item, and that is um, the rail reform matters. And I think David's going to take us through this report. Thanks, uh, Chair. Um, yes, item four is rail reform matters, and this uh, picks up on the submissions that Transport for the North made to the William Review over the last uh, year and a half or so, and really setting out our ambition um, for rail reform and, in due course, further devolution in the North. So we made our inputs to the Williams Review. Um, we're obviously still awaiting uh, a white paper. Um, we do think that is uh, due in the next few weeks, but we don't have a, a firm date for that from the government. Clearly, uh, COVID is uh, affecting uh, the timing of things like this. Um, but this paper is really about us developing, uh, starting to develop a response in advance of the white paper. I think the COVID crisis uh, has really highlighted some of the best collaboration uh, that we've had in the North in recent times, working with the operators and industry. You'll hear about them. You hear from them in, on the next item in terms of some of the work they're doing on, on short term changes. Um, but it's also highlighted some of the challenge of, of perhaps more decisions being made centrally, particularly during the fast moving COVID crisis and the change in franchise agreements to different forms of, of contract to deal with the immediate issues. So in the light of that, we're suggesting that uh, a phased approach to further Dev devolution, further involvement is probably the sensible way to go, uh, given the uncertainty. And I think it's also an opportunity because it allows us to make some progress on this agenda in the light of what is still huge uncertainty around uh, when demand will recover, the sustainability of funding, et cetera, that's touched on in, uh, in other papers. So the opportunities we really identified in the paper are firstly to strengthen some of the provisions in the existing partnership, particularly around uh, making greater use of local business units. So there's a very successful model uh, in the northeast uh, already where there's a lot more local uh, joint working. That could be rolled out to other parts of the north, not just um, uh, urban areas, but, but rural areas as well. And that's something we can explore with partners. There's also an opportunity um, to expand the uh, defined uh, Transport for the North matters under the partnership agreement with DFT um, to ensure you're getting more input on the right, uh, the right items. Other things we highlight in the paper is the uh, need to simplify the first and ticketing offer, particularly um, uh, in order to uh, encourage passengers back. That's something we've strongly supported as Transport for the North and it's something that's referenced as, as part of the review as well. So highlighted that. And, and finally, uh, building a stronger relationship with Network Rail. We have representatives from Network Rail on the call today, um, but Network Rail are clearly going to have a, already have a, a, a big role in the industry and uh, things like the uh, 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 devolution within Network Rail to their regions, uh, making them more accountable to local people um, implies that we need a very, very strong relationship with Network Rail as the infrastructure provider going forward. So uh, the paper then sets out that approach. If you endorse it uh, today, we'll work with partners, i.e. representatives from the authorities across the north, to develop a strong response to the Williams Review when it is published, um, and uh, really asking to note the paper and uh, endorse the next steps set out. Thank you. Brilliant. Thanks for that, uh, David. I'm not seeing any indications for to raise any points, or but anyone is welcome to do so if they, they wish to. Obviously, this is uh, a really sort of important uh, step forward, and, and Carl's uh, just indicating, so I'll bring Carl in accordingly. Thank you, Chair. I think we would all agree on this committee that it's right and proper that elected leaders from across the north are involved in these major decisions. And I think obviously we're closer to 
the residents and the passengers who um, have first hand experience of traveling right across the north. So, first of all, I'd just like to sort of reiterate that that element of the of the report. For me, it's vital that we're involved in, at the heart of any decisions that affect those. And I think that's the sort of sentiment that the Real North Committee and the Transport for the North Board was set up um, all those many years ago. Um, I just wanted to reference specifically the, um, the, the the part of the report that refers to the Northeast Rail Management Unit. And just to ask the committee really for some support, because I think there's a big opportunity here in the northeast with the structure um, that we've got to be able to pilot some of the work in particular around the Northumberland line and looking at service specification and future contract management um, and using that structure that we have in the northeast to be able to get greater local democratic control and accountability over some of the real services. Um, I'll just end there, Chair. Yeah, brilliant. Thanks for that, Carl. And I think we all sort of strongly support all the things that you've you just said there. And, and Heather's indicated, I'm not sure if it's on a similar point or something different. Um, but, uh, yeah, sorry, I'll just switch this. I'll just switch this phone off. Sorry about that. No, it's... Um, yes, just to follow on from what Council Marshall's saying, obviously the North East Regional Man Management Unit is working very well and the Tees Valley Combined Authority um, uh, really um, are pleased that it is mentioned within the report and I think it's something that probably can be rolled out in other areas. It is important that locally we do have an input and, and I think this unit is working extremely well. Brilliant. Thanks ever so much for that, uh, Heather. Um, obviously, endorse both of what Carl and Heather have, have just said, because I think this is a really important moment. We've been waiting for a very long time for the Williams uh, report to find its way into a white paper from government. And it's vital that we have a very strong response as Transport for the North, representing 15 million people right across the north of, of, of England. And obviously, uh, in working up that response, things like the kind of business units that are being used in the North East may well be uh, a very sort of suitable and appropriate way of having an even more localised approach for passengers and local economies right across the, the north of England. And I think none of us would ever tolerate a situation of going back to a situation where rail services were being decided by a diktat in Whitehall because, quite frankly, those models just didn't work in the past. So we need to have something that's certainly more focused on, on the needs of, kind of local people and local businesses across the north of England going into the future. OK, if we can then endorse those recommendations, if that's agreed... Uh, again, not seeing a dissent, so we'll take that as read and move on to uh, the next item, which is the update on the operational um, uh, rail issues. Adam's going to take us through the report, but I also know we're going to have uh, each of uh, our kind of uh, colleagues from the operating community, Northern, TPE and Network Rail, I think are going to do a very short presentation themselves to bring us up to, to speed on a few things before we can then have some questions and discussions. So, Adam, over to you first. Thanks, Chair. So, um, as noted in the report, as part of the, the Rail North uh, Operations Group that we have, uh, we've developed a set of principles to, to guide the industry in, in how we deal with, um, you know, the resource uncertainty uh, and the unpredictability uh, that we have at the moment. So, uh, we'd welcome any feedback from uh, from members on, on those principles um, as we go through. The report also asks the committee to support the North East uh, in strongly promoting the retention of two trains per hour north of Darlington on TPE's North East services for the upcoming East Coast Mainline consultation, which uh, TFN uh, will no doubt put an input and, and uh, individual uh, authorities as well. Um, just to note that that, um, that is separate from the uh, additional service that runs uh, currently between Redka uh, via Middlesbrough. So that's uh, that's on top of that. Um, lastly, um, uh, as a result of lockdown, resource availability, you know, continues to be a key challenge. Um, and several operators have, have, have had to, to look to make uh, some changes over the next few weeks. Um, so the changes are designed to provide uh, deliverable, resilient timetables. Uh, that meets the current demand and, and the operational requirements, you know, such as driver training. Um, but uh, obviously the key uh, difference this time is the ability to step back up quickly in, in just a matter of weeks um, if demand requires it, and particularly in light of school travel and, and how that uh, uh, will be affected, um, 
potentially as we come out of February half term and other changes. So um, the North of England Contingency Group, which includes um, officers, representatives from 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 all your um, areas, uh, were briefed yesterday on the detail of the changes. Um, so uh, so please see your your officers for, for for that detail. But I will give a quick summary of of those not on the call, uh, and then I'll I'll leave um, those on the call to to talk about some of the detail. So as you're probably aware, Hull Trains and Grand Central have again suspended their services. Um, LNER, Avanti and East Coast, uh, uh, sorry, and East Midlands Rail, they'll all be amending services over the next coming weeks. Uh, Cross Country will be uh, amending train lengths only uh, to meet demand. Um, and also there'll be there'll be some strong communications from each of those operators, both to, you know, to local stakeholders, but importantly to uh, to passengers in advance so that they're aware of the changes. Um, so uh, as, as Chair has mentioned, I've got Rob Warns, Strategic Direct Development Director of Northern, uh, Jerry Farkerson, Service Planning Director of TPE, and they'll uh, be here to just provide a quick summary of, of the impact of their services. Uh, and also Phil James, who's the uh, Route Director for the Northwest Region of Network Rail, who's always also going to give a quick update on the impact on Network Rail and and how uh, operators are coordinating uh, between during this period of time. So I'll I'll, I'll bring on uh, Rob uh, Rob first. Good morning, Chair. Good morning, everybody. Um, so um, in response to the government's latest uh, lockdown announcement last week, um, we were asked to um, consider revising our timetables to reflect a significant drop in demand. Um, it, so far since lockdown, it's not gone down as far as the levels we saw um, last spring, but we have seen a significant step down at the back end of, that, of last week and early this week. Um, so we are replanning our timetables to uh, be able to deliver something that's um, reliable and resilient through the um, lockdown period. We need to take into account that some of our available staff that, that we rely upon to operate our services um, we will have a reduction in staff available. We've seen um, significant increases in people self-isolating, um, the, the recent instructions for more shielding um, and people that are actually sick um, with, with COVID. So from next Monday, the 18th, we are putting in a timetable that is similar to the one we operated back in July. Um, so that is a reduction um, on, on, on some routes. We have put that plan in initially for four weeks, which takes us through to the middle of February, when we believe government will make some 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 fresh announcements on on schools. Um, and, and as Adam said, um, the, we have been asked that anything we put in, we can try and reverse out or at least modify within a within a further two week time scale. So if government does announce in February that schools will be reopening, we will be looking at layering some trains back in that were particularly um, useful for getting um, uh, our kids to 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 the schools. Um, so it's a similar operation to um, what we had in July, um, which is on, on most of the routes, it's still the sort of mainly hourly operation. But on some routes, we are we are we are dropping um, in, in, in frequency. Plan applies Saturday um, as well as Monday to Friday. Um, but Sundays will remain unchanged um, because of the low levels we operate um, on Sunday. So in summary, the, we're trying to operate best service we can with, with an increased um, challenge on our, our, our driver and conductor and engineering resource base, but a service that is still use, useful to get key workers and, and critical workers um, to um, make the essential journeys. The um, timetable information was uploaded last night into NRES, so um, people can go on to National Rail Inquiries and see what the plan looks like um, from Monday, and timetables will be available later in this week on our website. So back to you, Adam. Thanks, Rob. Uh, if I bring in uh, Jerry from uh, TP. Thanks, Adam. Uh, good morning, Ed Chair. Good morning, everybody. Um, from a Transpennine perspective, um, we are not planning to amend our timetable at this time. Um, we are working on having shelf ready interventions for the next few weeks if they are required. Um, and that would be a thinning out of service 
along the lines as Rob's just explained from Northern IE thinning, thinning the service frequency out. But at this stage, we're not planning any service um, decrement, um, but we will keep uh, you and your officers informed as the position um, develops over the next few weeks. Thank you. Adam? Thanks, Jerry. Uh, I bring in Phil from uh, Network Rail. Yeah, good morning, everybody. So in line with uh, Rob and Jerry's update, we've been working with our train planning colleagues to facilitate these amendments in the in the timetables. We're currently seeing across um, Network Rail for the north of England around a 5% absence uh, gap. That's either p- people that have been um, tested uh, as positive for covid whether those are self-isolating or whether they're uh, clinically vulnerable. And at present, that gives us no um, risk to our current maintenance operations or renewals activities across the the north of England. We are seeing spikes in certain areas, and that's in line with uh, government reporting. Uh, As a result of that, our focus is currently on assuring ourselves that our COVID secure locations are still fit for purpose. Uh, and that includes our joint control rooms where we have colleagues from uh, TPE, Northern and uh, Rail. Uh, that includes our stations as well. And we're also gaining assurances on our staff behaviours as well. So uh, maintaining that social distancing, using PPE for the critical tasks that they carry out. We have seen some colleagues in Network Rail recently trial the lateral flow tests at critical locations. And we are expecting delivery of those uh, 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 very imminently. That will enable us to manage attendance for work for colleagues in our critical locations that have been contacted through track and trace and that allows them us to bring people in into work. We'll also be picking up some voluntary testing to um, recognise those that may be asymptomatic. In terms of our station, we have seen in line with um, what Rob said from Northern, we have seen numbers decrease but we haven't got to the same levels as we saw in July last year. So people are following the latest government advice. And we're using our social media uh, platforms to give confidence in our cleaning regimes and that our stations are safe for those key workers and those that are critical to uh, using transport at this time. And that's it for Network Rail. Thanks, Phil. Uh, That's it for me, uh, Chair. Yeah, thanks ever so much for for that. And can I just sort of start before I bring everyone else in, just to thank sort of Phil, Rob and Jerry and all of their teams for all the hard work that they're doing. I I really appreciate how challenging, particularly with uh, the staffing resource element because of people being ill or kind of having to self-isolate, how difficult it is to put together a resilient railway service. Um, Equally, would ask that kind of you pass on our kind of thanks as well to all of your frontline staff. Uh, You know, COVID is really, really tough and and very, very stressful for people that are doing those kind of vital key worker roles to sort of maintain essential journeys. So if you can make sure you pass that on, it very much is appreciated by all of us across the north on behalf of uh, all the travelling public uh, in the north. Um, have we got anyone that wants to kind of ask any questions or kind of raise any comments? Um, I'm not seeing any indications uh, at this stage. Um, if not, um, oh, sorry, Heather, you're... Yes, I just wondered whether I could ask Rob. He did say that um, notification of the new timetables had been sent out yesterday. I haven't actually seen that. Um, You know, obviously on behalf of Tees Valley, I'm concerned about the uh, Darlington Saltburn line. Okay. So um, we sent out some summary um, to all the local authorities yesterday who joined us on a TFN contingency call yesterday morning and Tees Valley was was represented. represented. Tees Valley then had further conversations with our regional team in the afternoon. Um, So your guys are aware of of the drop in frequency, but we are maintaining an early service between Saltburn, Darlington and Bishop Auckland. Um, and the timetables have us say gone on to national rail inquiries um, overnight. So people in, in, in your region and your constituents can see what train service they're getting next week via national rail inquiries. OK, I appreciate that. Obviously, I was involved in quite a lot of work, of, uh, work yesterday for COVID. So I get caught up today. Thanks for that, uh, Rob. Thank you. Thank you. Brilliant. Is there anything else anyone wants to raise at this stage? Um, 
If not, if we can just sort of uh, note the report and the recommendations that are, are with it and obviously just continue to sort of thank our operator colleagues and, and look forward to working with them over the kind of weeks and, and months ahead. OK, uh, let's move on then. Uh, item number six is planning for the future. I think David's going to take us through this report. Yes, yeah, thanks, uh, Jeff. This report um, deals with a couple of issues. And the first one is what we're calling a roadmap to recovery. And really, this is about life after COVID or as things start to return to normal. Clearly, uh, people are not traveling, as we've just heard so much at the moment. Um, but uh, in previous meetings, you've discussed the need to have a plan to ensure that uh, we can encourage people back at the right time and people can come back to railway with confidence. Confidence was the key uh, message, I think, from the uh, previous meetings of the of the committee earlier in the year. That was an issue that you felt had really been uh, dented in terms of passengers, um, obviously with a number of lockdowns, encouraged uh, not to travel um, unless uh, essential. So um, actually getting people to come back and, and get back into the habit of using the railway. So um, the report also highlights the extra government funding that's going in to keep the railways running, which is obviously very, very welcome. But it does present potentially an ongoing challenge when you look at the numbers involved. Um, it's, you know, something like three times the amount of subsidy that was going into some of the old franchises um, for, um, you know, a much reduced numbers of passengers. So clearly, sustainability in the long term is about building that uh, demand and patronage back up and, and bringing in more revenue uh, to offset that uh, significant subsidy line. There's lots of uncertainty about the length of time for demand to recover. We are plugged in and tuned in to a lot of industry um, forecasting and scenario planning. I think the truth is it's unprecedented and nobody really knows, but there are some good good scenarios out there. I think aside from that, because they are only scenarios and forecasts, it's really about us having a plan to encourage people back to, to rail and do that in a sustainable way. So we've taken the themes that you discussed at previous meetings and really fleshed that out into this roadmap. And you'll see from the, from the diagram in Appendix 1, there's six core themes. So recovery of demand. So that's partly about adjusting services to demand. We're seeing a, 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 an adjustment downwards in some cases, as, as Rob has outlined on Northern. But also importantly, as we said, uh, how quickly those services can be stepped back up and a plan to step back up. This is only a temporary um, issue to deal with the, the, the lockdown and, uh, and staff availability. We've then got rebuilding confidence as the second theme. And, and really, essentially, we think that is all about communication. So um, there's a couple of different phases of communications um, uh, messaging suggested that will be needed as people come back to rail there. Um, and that could also include offering promotions, ticket fares and ticketing promotions, that sort of thing to encourage people back. Um, improved performance, we've talked about that under the last item. And, you know, one of the big benefits of uh, less people traveling and less trains on the network is much better performance. Uh, the key thing here is how do we maintain that? So clearly we don't want to go back to some of the performance we had after May 18. So working with the operators to make sure the timetables as they're ramped up are resilient. We don't overcommit services to infrastructure that, that can't cope with them. So um, a whole theme around that. Fares and ticketing is the next theme, and that is particularly focused on rolling out flexi seasons. Again, Northern and uh, other operators have uh, made a good start, and Northern will be rolling that out further. Um, but also uh, commitment to uh, moving to pay-as-you-go, bank cards, that sort of thing, piloting those is all part of the strategy we've, we've set out there. As you know, Transport for North has been very active in promoting that work, and we want to see that uh, rolled out across the North over the next few years. We then got a sustainable growth, by which we mean really there's an opportunity here to actually promote the use of rail to particularly car drivers. If there is spare capacity, as we come back out of COVID, particularly in the peak, the morning peak, uh, because people have changed their working habits, there are less people working in offices. That is an opportunity to target car drivers and get some of the mode shift onto rail in a very sort of positive way. But that will need uh, careful messaging, uh, targeted offers and campaigns to do that. 
an item six is around the investment plan. And I think really important thing here, uh, this plan does need underpinning by investment in, in infrastructure and uh, fares and ticketing and so on. And it's about short term investment to get the railway on a more sustainable footing in the long term. If you remember the whole ethos of, of what Rail North has done um, uh, over the, the previous franchises was about improving the offer, growing the market and ultimately reducing the subsidy. And in a way, the COVID recovery is uh, a similar situation. We, we have got a situation where we need to grow, grow the market and grow, grow revenue. And uh, that needs some investment in the short term to do that. So we've, we've highlighted the investment pipeline. So if, if you're happy to endorse this today, we will, we will develop it into a more detailed action plan and set out the initiatives that flow from it. We will um, submit that to the Rail North Partnership Board, the Department for Transport, as our input to, to the recovery. And we'll work with the operators on, on some of the details of the particular campaigns and promotions, etc. cetera. Um, there's just a couple of other items in the report to highlight. There's uh, the business planning. Uh, we're still in discussions on next year's budget and business plan. There will be uh, discussion at the TFN board meeting uh, later in the week on that. So we're not in a position to finalise that yet. Um, so that's still still ongoing. And finally, there is an updated uh, forward plan for the committee. Um, if there are any further items you want to commission as a committee uh, for future meetings, then you've got an opportunity to request that on us today. Um, so we're asking you to endorse the roadmap to recovery, note the position on the business plan, and uh, consider the forward plan. Thank you. Brilliant. Thanks for that, uh, David. Is there anything anyone wants to, any questions you want to ask, anything you want to raise, particularly in terms of any future papers that they want developing? Carl? Yeah, Chair, thanks. I, I just think it's important important that we um, we acknowledge which i'm sure we all do the importance that the real industry is going to play as we come out of this awful pandemic and as we look to kickstart the economy and recover the economy from the the deep deep recession that we're in um you know make no bones about it the one of, one of the biggest things the government can do nationally to um support the country's recovery and the recovery for the north in particular is to resource some of the infrastructure projects that we have and some of the projects that Transport for the North and the Real North Committee have spoken about for an awful long time. Um, so I just think it's important that we, we we sort of acknowledge that and note that and continue with that ask to government. And I know there's work going on behind the scenes on the um, on on the Northern Powerhouse Rail proposal and the outline business case that will be signed off um, within the next couple of, of months. So I just I just wanted to to make that point, Chair. Under no uncertain terms, we, we need to be clear that the role of the rail industry in the recovery is absolutely vital. Absolutely, 100%. I couldn't put that better myself, uh, Carl. At the end of the day, we can't build back better with a car-led recovery. We have to have one that kind of uh, gives us a strong rail network, environmentally and economically, into the future. Okay. I've got uh, Judith indicating as well. Judith? Oh, hi. Um, can you hear me, Liam? Y yes, we can, yeah. I've switched onto, a di onto my iPad from away from my laptop. I'm sorry about the previous meeting. Um, just to support the last comments um, and making sure that the, you know, the climate emergency is absolutely still um, at the core of what we're, we're doing. I just want to stress with all of the, the difficulties that we've been discussing today that it doesn't diminish the fact that the local knowledge and the local voice is still going to be incredibly important and whatever changes um come in um we mustn't lose that well, i think we've made a lot of progress um over the last 18 months or so on that agenda and um we have to make sure that's that's at the forefront um obviously we're uncertain about um recovery in terms of passenger um numbers and habits and we know whether you know, um, there has been a suspicion that people might reduce the number of days that they travel or go to work. So I um, just really want to make sure that DFT really takes seriously the, the need for a flexible ticketing model. Um, and, you know, that we have that as um, one of our priorities going forward so that we don't um, put people off from using the train because because it would mean them um, shelling out a lot more than they need to and that we come up with some really good good packages and offers that they can take uh, take up 
absolutely agree entirely with that. If we'd actually to encourage people back on, it's got to be really good value. S- simple as, as that. Do, do you want to come back in, Judith? That your digital hand has, has gone up again. No, oh, no. Oh. Sorry, I thought I was turning it off. It's... No, that is, it's fine. Oh, it's got a light on my phone. I'm really sorry. <laughs> no, it's, it's okay. I, I assume that's a digital Mexican wave um, in the kind of yeah, uh, yeah. virtual meeting parlance. I had uh, Chris um, indicating uh, as well. Chris, do you want to come in? Thank you very much. Mine will be fairly brief. I agree with what everybody else has said. But the most encouraging sign I heard from all our presenters was they had built in the fact that if things did change to the advantage, they'd be able to react very quickly. And I think that's another key thing, that we react to changing circumstances quickly. And everyone knows what my suggestion is, to persuade people back on. Rail travel has to be made extremely attractive. And I've suggested halving affairs, but I don't suppose I should win that argument. Well, if you don't ask, Chris, you don't get. So I'm sure, kind of, uh, it's something we can uh, we can factor in um, in terms of um, our discussions with with government accordingly. <laughs> um, David, is there any of those points you want to to come back on? Uh, because I think that's a strong endorsement of all the kind of uh, principles in the paper and fleshing up the kind of uh, that plan uh, of how we want to kind of uh, build back better. But do you want to come back on anything? Well, just really say thanks. Thanks for the endorsement. We'll we'll work that through. I think it's something we, you know, if this is now the endorsed plan, we'd want to bring this back to the committee at future meetings and and show uh, progress or, or where we need uh, further further support um, uh, on on some of those measures. There's quite a lot in the plan, um, but I think uh, you know a real a real push is is needed um, as. Uh, uh, and, and it does need, you know, the input from train operators. I've talked to operators, um, particularly uh, northern, about some of the uh, uh, promotional uh, opportunities, and uh, you know they're looking for our support to, to, to bring these these things through their business plan. And, and, and Transpennine Express will be will be similar as well. So we'll work with with the operators and industry to 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 work up the right. Uh, type of things and the right messaging at the appropriate time. It's you know, hard to say what that is now, um, but as we as we move out of lockdowns, uh, we'll make sure we, we bring these things forward. Okay, excellent. Thanks for that, uh, David. Well, in that case, if we can just agree the recommendations uh, in the report, and I'm not seeing any kind of dissent, so we shall take that uh, as agreement. Um, moving on then, the seventh item is obviously the exclusion of, of press and public. So if I can move the relevant uh, motion uh, accordingly and wait for um, Gary, can you confirm to me when the, the recording switched off and anyone that shouldn't be with us um, is no longer with us? Yeah, we'll do. I'm just going to check when it's um, when it stopped recording. Um.